Um, I'm going to have you turn in your Bibles to uh, Isaiah chapter 45. And before I show you that, I want to remind you that what we started talking about last week was we talked about having a breakthrough in our lives, that everybody that I know needs a breakthrough of some sort. Now, what is a breakthrough? A breakthrough is a sudden burst a sudden burst of victory in your life, the bursting forth, the sudden bursting forth of victory in some area of your life. That's a breakthrough. Now, Jesus paid for our salvation. He paid for our deliverance. He paid for our healing. He did it all on the cross. Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. In other words, I fulfilled the law. I became sin so that you could become righteous. I took the curse so that you could become blessed. I took your stripes by your stripe, by his stripes, you're healed. He took death so that you could experience life. He took the curse so you could experience the blessing. He took sin so that you could experience righteousness and he became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. But in becoming that and in doing all of that, you say, well, how could Jesus do all that? But I'm not seeing it in my life. Well, that's what a breakthrough is all about. A breakthrough is when you see it burst forth like he, he already paid for it. But now it healing bursts forth into your body. Deliverance bursts forth into your mind. Freedom bursts, bursts forth into your soul. Blessing bursts forth into your life. Wisdom bursts forth into your mind. You see, these are breakthroughs and every breakthrough starts with what we learned last week. Every breakthrough starts with what? A discovery. Every breakthrough starts with a discovery. Every breakthrough starts with what? A discovery. In other words, every technological breakthrough, every um, scientific breakthrough, every medical breakthrough on this earth it started with a discovery, a discovery of penicillin, a discovery of, of electricity, a discovery of, uh, of, 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 of how, to, how to harness water or how to harness energy, how to harness the heat of the sun, how to harness the, um, the, 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 the oil that is in the earth and turn it into fuel that, impo- that powers your car or turns into fuel that heats your home or turns into fuel that, that turns lights on. Like it's amazing that every breakthrough happened or started with a discovery first, a discovery, a discovery. And the sooner we get a hold of this, that the Christian life, once we're born again, the Christian life is not about us obtaining things from heaven. The Christian life is not about us trying to get heaven to come to the earth. The Christian life is a life of discovery. It's not a life of attainment like I have to attain a healing. I have to attain salvation. I got to get heaven to open up and and give me the money that I need and give me the ideas that I need. But no, it's not a life of of attainment. It's not a life of obtainment. It's a life of discovery. It's a life of discovery. It's discovering what God has already made available to us. It's discovering. And today the focus is discovering the treasure in you, discovering the treasure in you. Today we're going to discover the treasure in you. I want you to say that. Say there's a treasure in me. Now, this is what I want to do all year with you guys this year is I want to just spend time discovering the treasures that are inside of you and learning how to tap into those treasures like you learning how to tap into the treasures that are that God has put inside of you and learning how to harness the treasures that God has put inside of you so that those treasures, the discovery of those things will produce breakthroughs in your life, that the discovery of these treasures will produce breakthroughs in your life. A breakthrough comes when there's a discovery. And today we're going to focus on the breakthrough that will come when you discover the treasure in you, the treasure in you, the treasure in you. Let me let me share a quick story several years ago. And this is you can look this up. But several years ago, Santa Fe resident Forrest Fenn at the time he was 84 years old, he hid a treasure chest in New Mexico, somewhere in New Mexico, in the state of New Mexico, after filling the treasure chest with coins and diamonds and sapphires and rubies and gold nuggets from his personal collection. And the only clues to the treasure's whereabouts came in the appropriately titled book that he wrote called The Thrill of the Chase. 
inside of the book. It was published in 2010. Inside of the book were nine clues to where the treasure chest was buried. And since that time, treasure hunters have combed the state in search of the treasure chest. And although Fenn said that some had come close, no one at the time of this story, no one had found it. I haven't researched it. Maybe somebody found it by now. But he was speaking to the Albuquerque news station, K.O.A.T. News, and he estimated that 30,000 people came looking the first summer and he estimated another 50,000 would come that summer. And people, what were they coming for? They were coming to 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 search for the treasure that he had hidden. And everybody went to like if you knew it was in New Mexico, everybody would go to New Mexico. If you knew it was in Cleveland, everybody would go to Cleveland because that'd be the only reason anybody would go to Cleveland. (laughs) Even LeBron left Cleveland. (laughs) And inside of this book is a poem that has the nine clues that show where the treasure actually is. Well, I got better news to tell you than that. You don't have to read a poem to figure out where the treasure is. All you got to do is read the Bible and you'll discover where the treasure is. Hmm. Let me try that again. All you got to read All you got to All you got to do is read the Bible to discover where the treasure is. Oh, 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 that's good. That's good. Now, now everybody on social media will think you said that the first time. No, I'm just kidding. Let me show you something. The treasure Isaiah 45, verse three in the New Living Translation, Isaiah 45, verse three. And I will give you treasures hidden in the darkness, secret riches. I will give you treasures hidden in the darkness, secret riches. Now, in case there's anybody here that's too holy to let me finish this 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 teaching today. Let me assure you that the treasures he's talking about here are not limited to financial material things. You say, oh, this pastor, man, I got to get away from this church. They're just talking about material things. First of all, I'm quoting the Bible. And the treasures I'm talking about are things that money can't buy. He said, I will give you treasures hidden in the darkness, secret treasures. And I will do this so that you will know. Now, notice why God's doing it so that you will know that I'm the Lord. In other words, when you discover the treasures that he's placed inside of you, the only response you'll have is you'll be so amazed. You'll be so thankful. You'll be so in awe that you'll say only Jesus could have done this. Only God could have done this. Only God could have hidden these things inside of the human soul, inside of the human spirit, in inside of the human body. No wonder the devil comes to steal, kill and destroy because he understands about the treasure inside of you more than you might understand the treasure inside of you. Wow, this treasure, man. All we got to do is search for it. It's in us. It's in you. You say where Where does God hide these treasures? Well, we learned last week in Second Corinthians, chapter four, verse seven, he hides these treasures in earthen vessels, in earthen vessels. He hides the treasures in earthen vessels. That's our physical bodies. We know that this light shining is in ourselves like fragile in fragile jars of clay vessels. We're the vessels containing. Look at what he says in in this verse in Second Corinthians four, seven inside of these fragile jars of clay contain this great treasure. And this makes it clear it's from God. Look at what he says. And this makes it clear it's from God, not from ourselves. You wouldn't have known all that's inside of you unless God put it in there. You wouldn't have been able to create it. God put it in there. Let me start. Um, like do an inventory of this treasure inside of you with this verse so that you can see what I mean here in um, first Corinthians, chapter three, verse 16. Look, notice what he says. First Corinthians, chapter three, verse 16. He says, do you not know? 
that you are a temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, this is some amazing treasure. And what he is saying is what what Paul is revealing to us is you if you're born again, you have this treasure inside of you, but you may not even know it. People could have treasure inside of them and you not even know it because he says, don't you know it? Didn't you know? Don't you realize it? He's not saying, hey, here's how to get this treasure inside of you. He's saying so many people are ignorant that this treasure is inside of you. You're the temple of God. He's saying they were living a lifestyle built upon their ignorance that they had the spirit of God dwelling in them. Like once you realize you have the spirit of God dwelling in you, you can draw on that spirit to comfort you. The Bible says the Holy Spirit will comfort you. The Holy Spirit will teach you. The Holy Spirit will anoint you. The Holy Spirit will heal you. The Holy Spirit will give you wisdom. The Holy Spirit will open your eyes. The Holy Spirit will reveal his love to you. The Holy Spirit will do all of these things once you discover that you're a temple where he actually lives. And I'll show you how to like like take the cork off, like uncork the treasure that's inside of you. And he says, the spirit of God dwells in you, not just any spirit, the spirit of God. You look at what he says in Romans chapter eight, verse 11 about this Romans chapter eight, verse 11. He says, now the same spirit, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Where does his spirit dwell? Where does his spirit dwell in you? Say in me, his if you're born again, all that means is that you've accepted Jesus Christ as your savior. You believe he died for your sins and rose from the dead. At that moment, you believe that you're born again. That happened to me without even knowing the terminology born again. It happened to me when I accepted Jesus as my savior and Lord. I was born again. I believed he rose from the dead. I was born again. I didn't even know what that term. I had never even heard that. It took weeks before I saw that. Maybe a few days I saw it in the Bible and understood it. But I'm still understanding what all that's all that it means. It means when you get born again, God gives you a new spirit and then puts his spirit in your spirit and he dwells inside of you. And the greatest treasure that you could have inside of you is God himself. God himself is in you. And the, and the problem with most Christians is that they're living in ignorance of what's inside of them. They're not living without the spirit. They're just living without accurate knowledge about the spirit and about where he is and what he's capable of. Well, we see in verse 11 here what he's capable of raising the dead. The spirit of God raised Jesus from the dead. And that same spirit lives inside of you when you're born again. He dwells in you. His spirit dwells in you, not a different Holy Spirit, not Uh, not an unholy spirit, not an inferior spirit, not a junior spirit, the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells inside of you. And our ignorance of that is what keeps us defeated. Our ignorance of that is what keeps us defeated, keeps us lonely, keeps us insecure, keeps us afraid. It's our ignorance of what's inside of us. And so my job is not to preach a new sermon to you. I don't even like that word sermon. And I don't I don't even like sermon. What's a sermon like? And you know what? In our society now, we're in a woke society, so I'll just go ahead and call it a Herman. (laughs) Rather than a sermon. Because it's for the sirs and for the hers. See, 
see I'm woke. I'm not here to come up with some new fancy message that you can say, wow, wasn't that great preaching? What did he talk about? I don't remember, but it was great. (laughs) No, I'm here to I'm here to help you discover the greatness, the greatness that's inside of you, 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 the greatness inside of you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. Let me show you how great the Holy Spirit is. You see, the first manifestation, the first thing, the most important thing the Holy Spirit brings is not conviction, although he brings that. But it's not what most people think conviction is. They think conviction is feeling guilty. Conviction is being convinced of something, by the way. But the first thing that the Holy Spirit brings, the first order of business when the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you is not to bring conviction. The first order of business that the Holy Spirit brings is not to bring you a prayer language called tongues. It's not to give you tongues. Although let me tell you something. The beautiful gift of tongues is something to never be ashamed of. And please never be shy about it. No matter what preacher says tongues isn't for today, they must not be living today, because if you're living in today, the gift of tongues is as powerful and as is is as important as it ever was. It's a beautiful prayer language between you and God, where the Holy Spirit is released, is releasing his wisdom in your life, mysteries in your life. When we speak in tongues, the Bible says we're speaking mysteries to God. It's a beautiful language that the devil cannot understand. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful gift. So it's not my topic today, but I just I honor the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And we should be we should believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Today is your day to believe that God has put inside of you greatness. He's put inside of you his spirit, whether you whether you accept what I'm saying or not, it's true anyway. Whether you live in it, whether you walk in it is is up to you to believe it. But the fact that it is that the Holy Spirit lives inside of you does not change just because you reject what I'm saying. Because when you get born again, he lives in you. And you can see from the scriptures, I'm not making this up. But the first order of business for the Holy Spirit is in Romans chapter five, verse five. And notice what he says in Romans chapter five, verse five. He says that uh, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So he says the first thing, the most important thing that the Holy Spirit pours into our lives is the love of God, the love of God. That the Holy Spirit's number one. Most important thing that he wants to do in our lives is pour out into our hearts the love of God. See, the Holy Spirit is not a debater. The Holy Spirit is not a theological argument. The Holy Spirit doesn't come to argue. He doesn't come to pour knowledge in such a way that you can that you can out argue any other Christian. I don't it boggles my mind why people get on social media and they just want to fight and they want to argue on Twitter and they want to argue on Instagram. And and some of them have overcooked my grits. <laughs> So I have fired back once or twice on on myself as stupidity. But then I realize I'm more stupid than them for thinking that they're smart enough to stop being stupid. (laughs) My God. Um. He he pours out love within us, within us. That's why I took you to Second Kings, Chapter four. Remember about the widow whose husband died? See, she needed a miracle. She needed a breakthrough in Second Kings, Chapter four. And I told you last week, but I want to remind you in Second Kings, Chapter four. Here's a woman who loses her husband. He dies and the creditors are coming to take her 
her children from her. In Second Kings, chapter four, verse two, verse one says this widow is cries out to Elijah. Hey, I need your help. My my husband is dead. Hey, listen, God is about to do a miracle in her life without a husband. I just want you to hear this, single people that God that God's greatest miracle in your life is not a husband. It's not a wife. Those are those are nice, nice additions in your life, but not essential. What's essential is that, you know, what's inside of you, not who's beside you, but what's inside you, what's inside you, what's inside you. So she says, my husband's dead and I need a miracle. And he says in verse two, what do you have in your house? He doesn't point her to a new husband. He doesn't point her to heaven. He doesn't point her to the neighbor. He points her to her own house. And he says, what do you have in the house? And she says, all I have is a jar of oil. And he says, that'll do. Go get some vessels so that you can pour the oil into the vessels. She only had one, but she ends up filling all the vessels. We know how the breakthrough started. The breakthrough, every miracle, every breakthrough starts when we shift our thinking from what we don't have to what we do have. When we shift our thinking from what we don't have to what we do have, she starts listing what she doesn't have. I don't have a husband. I don't have the money to pay the creditors. I got two sons that are going to be taken captive. Um, I don't have I don't have I don't have I don't have. And he says, what do you have, though? You're talking about what you don't have, what you don't have, what you don't have. And he says, what do you have, though? Because the miracle you need is not based on what you don't have. It's based on what you do have. And I want to get you focused on what you do have, because what you do have is going to take care of what you don't have. When you do, when you do with what you have, what God wants you to do with what you have, it'll take care of what you don't have. When you do what God says to do with what you have, it'll take care of what you don't have. When you realize, oh, I do actually I do have something. I have a jar of oil. And he says, okay, what you do have is going to take care of what you don't have when you do what God says with what you do have. That's why tithing produces breakthroughs. That's why witnessing to other people, telling other people about Jesus produces breakthroughs, talking to your family members about Jesus and praying for them. Prayer produces breakthroughs because prayer starts with what you with what you do have. Even when the Bible says. Be anxious for nothing. Guess what prayer starts with anxiety. It starts with what you do have. I got some anxiety. Okay, then take it and cast your cares upon the Lord. And whatever you pray for with thanksgiving, make your request known to God and peace will come. You started with anxiety and gratitude and prayer and you end up with peace. Every breakthrough starts with what you do have, with what you do have, with what you do have. And it turns into what you don't have when you do what God says to do with it. A shift of thinking from what we don't have to what we do have. Well, here's an example of what we don't of what we haven't been given compared to what we have been given. Second Timothy, chapter one, verse seven. Look at what he says. You know what it says. For God has not given you the spirit of fear or timidity. God has not given you. So guess what you don't have? You don't have fear. You haven't been given that. But what has he given you? Power, love and a sound mind. Now we're taking inventory, you see. So we've already talked about the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. Power lives inside of you. Love lives inside of you and a sound mind for everybody that thinks you're losing your mind. As we get older, we're like, man, am I losing my mind? Yeah, I'm losing my mind and I'm accepting his. I'm taking the mind of Christ. I'm losing mine. When I got saved, my brain was fried on drugs. It was like a 
it was like, you know, not over easy eggs. My, my brain was a skillet of not over easy, not over medium, not over hard, but just over <laughs> just fried. And I was like, this brain is got to be replaced with yours, Lord, because I don't know anything about anything. And I started reading the Bible and I started discovering how to think and what to believe and what God had done and what I have now, because you have something very precious inside of you. The Holy Spirit will tell you what to say when you don't know what to say. The Holy Spirit will comfort you when sorrow is overtaking your soul. The Holy Spirit will teach you when you can't seem to learn, when you need a tutor. You know, we go through school and everybody's taught the same in school. And the problem is not everybody learns the same. The problem is not everybody learns the same. So some kids need a tutor. And the good news is there's no shame in needing a tutor. We all get a tutor. His name is the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says he'll teach us everything we need to know. He'll remind us of what Jesus said. You see, whenever you're in a crisis, the first thing you should do is take inventory. What is inside of you? What do I have? Because remember, a crisis or a problem in your life is not something to be worried about. It's a signal that there is a problem that God has already equipped you to solve. A crisis is a signal that there is a problem in your life that God has already equipped you to solve. You just need to discover your equipment. The first part of your the best part of your equipment is the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. You are the temple of God. Everything in your life changes when you stop being ignorant of what you are and what's inside of you. You are the temple of God and his spirit dwells in you. And you've got power, love and a sound mind. You got power. Say, I got power, love and a sound mind. Oh, something very, very powerful about that. OK, listen. Um, Andrew Carnegie, maybe some of you heard of him because there's a place named after him called Carnegie Hall in New York, and he was the founder of U.S. Steel, a major steel company years ago. He was the founder of it. And Andrew Carnegie became one of the wealthiest men in America. And he had something in his company that was that blew everybody's mind. And this is this is uh, decades, decades ago. And he had 43 at the time he had 43 millionaires working for him at the company that would later be called U.S. Steel. He had 43 millionaires working for him. Now, this is at a time when being a millionaire was a big deal. Like, uh, of course, it's a big deal today, but not nearly how big of a deal it was 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years ago. A million dollars could go a whole lot further than it can go today. But he had 43 millionaires that worked for him in the company that would later become U.S. Steel. And a reporter once asked him doing an interview, said, how did you establish how did you assemble such a team of established millionaires? And Carnegie responded and said, those men were not millionaires when they came to me. Those men were not millionaires when they started here. Those men were not millionaires at the time. He said they became millionaires because of their hard work and because they believed in themselves and because I believed in them. Forty three millionaires. And so the, the reporter asked him, then how did you train these men to become so valuable that you would pay them so much money? How did you train them so that they would become so valuable that you would pay them such money? And Carnegie replied, these men develop women or men develop the same way gold is mined out. Several tons of dirt must be moved to mine one ounce of gold out of the ground. Several tons of dirt 
have to be removed to discover one ounce of gold. And he said, that's how these men that's how I trained these men. That's how I developed these men, that these men were willing with me to move a lot of dirt over their lives and over their souls so that we could mine out the gold that was inside of them. You see, the gold is already inside of you. The treasures are already inside of you. My job is to be an excavator in your life. Your job and my job together is to move the dirt, to move the dirt, to move the dirt and to discover the gold, to move the dirt, to move the dirt. You know what the dirt is? wrong mindsets. You know what the dirt is? It's thinking that you're not enough. It's thinking that you don't have it. It's being ignorant. It's not being aware that you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. You have gold inside of you. You have treasure inside of you. You have diamonds inside of you. That's what the dirt is. You know, most of religion has described the dirt in people's lives as your sin, your dirty, you dirty little smoker. Wonder how many cigarettes you had. Today. I wonder if you're vaping now, too. I wonder if you, now that now that marijuana, now that weed is legal in Illinois, you're probably doing that to you, filthy, dirty scum. That's not the dirt we need to get rid of. Now, don't go running out to get your CBD. I don't, I'm not saying it. I mean, I don't know what you do. Just do whatever you think God wants you to do. But listen to me. The dirt is not like the dirt is a dirty thought. If a boy has a thought about a thought, a dirty thought about a girl, Welcome to the world. <laughs> Boys have thoughts. Girls have thoughts, too. Hey, <laughs> let's get woke together. We're all up in it. Listen, we've been focusing on Dirty thoughts being lustful thoughts, greedy thoughts, selfish thoughts, you evil sinner. Dirt that is being removed is the dirt that is covering the gold. And it's the thoughts that say, I'm not worthy. I don't have it. I can't do it. I'm not enough. There's nothing good in me. I could never amount to much. Look at how I was born. I got the wrong side. I'm on the wrong side of the tracks. I'm the wrong color. I'm the wrong height. I'm the wrong. I'm the wrong size. I'm the wrong race. I'm the wrong gender. And everybody's trying to fix that stuff and trying to find their worthiness in that. That's those. That's the dirt that needs to be removed. All those mindsets that limit you, the mindsets that tell you, I can't, I can't, I can't. But God says to tell us, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. See, we got to we got to get rid of the dirt. The dirt is I can't. The gold is I can. The gold is there's a can of can in you. There's no can'ts in you. It's like Mickey told Rocky, this thing ain't no can't. <laughs> What's can't? There ain't no can't. Listen, there is no can't. There's can. Amen. Success doesn't come in camps. It comes in cans. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Christ is in me. The Holy Spirit is in me. Power, love and a sound mind. The world would stop if it were run by people that said it can't be done. In 1899, Charles Duell, commissioner of the U.S. Patent Office in charge of giving patents to inventors, he resigned from the company and he resigned from the government in 1899. And he said, we have reached the end. Everything that can be invented has been invented. That was 1899. In 1923, Robert Millikan, the Nobel Peace Prize winner in physics, said there is no likelihood that we will ever tap into the power of the atom. And yet we discovered the atom and the molecules that, 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 that it's made of to use it for power, nuclear energy, uh, all like we've harnessed power. We've dis we've had breakthroughs because we've had discoveries. In 1921, Hall of Famer, great Tris speaker said after Babe Ruth went from being a pitcher to a to a hitter, 
He said, young Mr. Ruth has made a mistake by giving up pitching to become a full time hitter. And Babe Ruth ended up hitting 713 home runs. That was that record was held for almost 100 years, wasn't broken until Hank Aaron broke it in 1973 or 74, something like that, um, with seven with his 714th home run. And that was a man that somebody said he could never become a home run hitter because he's a pitcher. Um, in just 12 years, Bill Gates became the richest man, the wealthiest man in the world. Twelve between 12 and 15 years as the founder of Microsoft, um, a great woman, a young woman from Chicago, born with a club foot, went on to win an Olympic gold medal. Her name her name was Wilma Rudolph. Um, the greatest small package service in the world today is the result of a man who refused to accept his college professor's opinion. His college professor told him that his idea was ridiculous and he gave him a failing grade. He went on to create FedEx. <laughs> Let me show you what I mean and how to use and how to tap in. And we'll close with this. I want to show you the verse in Philemon, chapter one, verse six. Philemon chapter one, verse six. This is how we activate the treasure inside of us. He says that the communication of your faith, Philemon verses, there's just one chapter in this book of Philemon, and it's it's beautiful. And verse six says that the communication of your faith will become effectual or your faith will become effective and it will spread in every area of your life. That's what the word communication is. It means to to share it, to spread it. It, that your faith will become effective and touch every area of your life by the acknowledging. Look at what he says, by the acknowledging of every good thing which is already in you in Christ Jesus. He said your faith becomes effective and it starts spreading and communicating victory into your life through the acknowledging of every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus. So the Christian life is not a life of attainment, but a life of acknowledgement, acknowledging what is already in you. I gave you four things today. The Holy Spirit. I gave you five. The Holy Spirit is in you. Greatness is in you. Greater is he will visit that another time. Greater is he that is in you than, he's, than he is in the world. And there's power, love and a sound mind. That's just the beginning of that's the tip of the iceberg of the greatness or, or of the treasures that are inside of you. And this verse shows us how to activate the treasure. He says, now let me break this word down for you and then we'll go. But notice what he says. He says, your faith becomes effective by acknowledging the, the, the things, every good thing that is already in you in Christ Jesus. Now, this word acknowledgement, it has, it has three words that it, it means. This word acknowledgement, it means to recognize. To recognize something, to be grateful for something and then to declare something to recognize, be grateful and declare those are the three definitions of this word acknowledge. So when he says your faith becomes effective through acknowledging every good thing in you, it's recognizing what's in you, being grateful for what's in you and declaring what is in you. Your faith becomes effective and starts moving mountains and changing things and shaping your future and healing your body and winning your family to Jesus and renewing your mind and healing your soul and giving you ideas and giving you inventions and giving you breakthroughs, the discovery of what's inside of you. It's acknowledging, recognizing that it's in you. It's it's thanking and being grateful, thanking God for what's inside of you. And it's declaring, speaking forth what's inside of you as we prophesy as sons and daughters of God to the dry bones and speak to the mountains and prophesy to our lives and declare what God says he's put inside of us the moment we're born again in Christ Jesus, the treasure is placed inside of you. And by acknowledging it, recognizing it, being grateful for it and declaring it, it becomes effective and causes your faith to touch your body and your faith to touch your family and your faith to touch your mind and your faith to touch your church and your faith to touch your job and your faith will touch your business and it will spread like wildfire in every area of your life. Let's stand together. Wow. 
Are you getting this? How many know I'm not giving you something? I'm I'm uncovering something. I'm uncovering something. Whatever is hidden will be revealed. That's not a negative verse. All your hidden sins are going to be revealed. No, all your hidden treasures are going to be revealed. Your hidden sins, Jesus already wiped away. And maybe you're here today and you got some sin and you're like, I don't I'm not a Christian. I'd like to get born again. Bow your heads with me with every head bowed. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, I want to pray with you right now with every head bowed. Would you just before you move and before you leave, just bow your heads out of, out of um, respect for the people around you. And if you'd like to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, be born again today and have the treasure inside of you today, the treasure of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Pray this with me out loud. Everybody watching can pray this and everybody who's already saved can pray this for those that are praying it for the first time. Just say, Heavenly Father, I invite Jesus Christ into my life as my Savior and Lord. I believe Jesus died for my sins and rose from the dead. And from this moment forward, I'm a child of God. With every head bowed, if you prayed that prayer to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, I'm going to count to three. And on the count of three, I'm going to ask that you lift up your hand on the count of three to acknowledge that you've received him as your Savior and Lord today. One, two, three, right where you're standing. Who will who will do that? God bless you. Who else? God bless you. Who else with these precious souls? God bless you right here, right here, right here. Who else you're receiving? God bless you. Congratulations. Who else? Come on, put your hand up high. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you way in the back. God bless you here. God bless you here. Come on, let's thank God for all these precious people receiving Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. And guess what? There is now a great treasure inside of you. And for the rest of our lives together, we're going to go on a treasure hunt. And this year especially, we're going to go on a treasure hunt, all of us. And if you just received Jesus as your Savior and Lord, hopefully one of our team members spotted you to give you this book, The Power of a New Life. And it takes you through step by step the next steps of this great, victorious Christian life. And our discovery class starts in February, where we're going to discover even more of the greatness that's inside of you and the treasures that are inside of you and develop those great treasures and those great things inside of you. You're in the right place today. If you're looking for a church filled with the love of God, you're in the right place. If you're looking for a church filled with the goodness of God, you're in the right place. If you're you're looking for a church filled with the with the kindness and grace of God that leads us to repentance, you're in the right place. If you're looking for the power of God, you're in the right place. If you're looking for imperfect people, you're in the right place. If you're looking for perfect people, you're in the wrong place. We're hip people, happy, imperfect people. Amen. But we're all a work in progress and go let let your light shine today. I love you guys. If you need prayer for anything else, come on up to the altar. One of our team members will pray for you and we'll see you Wednesday night, 7 p.m. God bless you guys are the best. I love you guys.